So this video is the first in what I hope will be a series of videos looking at great artistic works and trying to puzzle out what exactly it is that makes them beautiful. Now the first great work of art that I want to look at is the 1975 film Mirror by the late great Russian filmmaker Andrei Tarkovsky. Tarkovsky is probably best known for his two epic and influential science fiction films, Stalker and Solaris, but in my opinion Mirror is easily the equal of either of those films, and I believe one of the most beautiful films ever made. But, and let me just say this right up front, Mirror is also a deeply confusing and often bewildering film. Imagine a movie not only set, but filmed from deep within the human subconscious mind. And you, you have a pretty good idea of what Mirror is. It's a film full of memories and dreams that often bleed together in a way that makes it unclear where reality ends and fantasy begins. It's a film that's full of deeply surreal and often very symbolic shots that are also filmed in a series of dramatically different styles. You have some shots that are filmed in color, other that are filmed in black and white, some that are presented as kind of sepia-toned newsreel footage, and all of these different styles are switched between interchangeably. They're all kind of mixed together. Superficially, the film is anchored around the life of a single character, but the way it handles that life, the way it explores the life of that character is anything but straightforward. For one thing, the events of his life are presented completely out of chronological order. The film jumps freely between his childhood and his adolescence and his adulthood. But even beyond that, the film does a lot of additional things to obscure our understanding of this man and our ability to see his life clearly. For example, during the scenes where he's an adult, he's kept entirely off screen or almost entirely off screen, almost as if you're viewing those scenes directly from his first person perspective, but not exactly because the camera moves a little more freely than that. But the film goes through great lengths to not show his face clearly when he's an adult, which is a very weird thing for films, especially films that are fixated intimately on a human being's life to do. You, you would think the natural thing would to be to have a lot of close-ups and a lot of reaction shots and a lot of opportunities for the actor portraying this character to show you who he is through the emotion evident on his face, right? But instead, the film chooses to do everything in its power to not show you his face, to not let you see him in a clear and unambiguous way, at least as an adult. And in addition to that, there are many moments where the film will leave his perspective entirely, where it will suddenly become unhooked from his experiences and will be watching an experience that, say, his mother had that he couldn't possibly have seen, or will be watching the struggles of his son, even though he's not present in the scene. And the film even leaves his family entirely in a few moments to instead focus on like historical events, things that happened in Russian history. And that's where the newsreel footage comes in. So there's this weird tension in the film between deeply intimate moments that are very much very far inside this one man's head and these other scenes that are much more loosely related to his life and to his personal experience. And so if you're a viewer watching this film, especially for the first time, it can be a hugely disorienting experience. Think about it, just one of those techniques that I listed off would be confusing in and of itself. Now imagine all of them operating at once in the same movie. And that movie is only about an hour and 45 minutes long. So it's not even as if this is an epic film where all of these different disorienting and potentially alienating tactics 
are slowly unveiled over the course of its runtime. Instead, this is a really concentrated dose of pure confusion and pure bewilderment. But I think that's entirely intentional because one of the film's central themes is failed communication. The movie is full of scenes where characters simply fail to effectively communicate what they're thinking or feeling to each other. And the movie is especially full of moments of failed communication within families and within generations. You have multiple scenes in the movie where the central character bemoans the fact that he feels like he's losing touch with his mother. You have a phone call between him and his mother where they're both obviously trying to communicate something deeply important to them. He's trying to tell his mother about how he's been feeling and she's trying to tell him about the death of a close friend of hers and the conversation just breaks down. They just cannot talk to each other. And later in the film, you have similar scenes between the central character and his ex-wife and his son. He seems to be so totally and even cruelly out of touch with his son's life. You have moments where he's just really scathing in the way that he talks about his adolescent son. And in fact, a lot more screen time is spent between him and his ex-wife talking about how he can't understand his son than actually trying to communicate to his son. And all of this is really highlighted and underscored by a kind of fascinating artistic choice that Tarkovsky makes. And that's to have poems that were written by his father, Tarkovsky's father, read at different points in the film. But the way this poetry is presented and framed within the film is really interesting and really unusual. So what you might expect is for Tarkovsky to place these readings of his father's poems over scenes in the movie where they're a really good thematic fit. You know, where, you know, hypothetically, he might have, say, a love poem read over a romantic moment between you know, the central character and his wife. Or you might have a poem about the beauty of childhood read over this really intimate scene between the young version of the character and his mother or something like that. But that is not what Tarkovsky does at all. <laughs> not in the slightest. Instead, these poems are often deeply at odds with what's going on on the screen while they're being read. For example, there's this deeply optimistic poem that seems to be about immortality and about human resilience and about the beauty and nobility of human life. And it is read over this really grueling and depressing and demoralizing bleak newsreel footage of Russian soldiers from World War I just hauling around heavy artillery through the mud, through just deeply adverse conditions. It's not even glorious heroic battle sequences or anything. It's just grueling scenes of agonizing human labor in the midst of war. And it's such an odd contrast. And whenever Tarkovsky's father's poems pop up in the movie, there's always this sense of contrast and conflict and the sense of his father's words being somewhat or very out of step with the artistic choices his son is making as a director. And that, to me, was really weird the first time I watched the film. I was like... I don't understand They're, the words I'm seeing on the screen and the images I'm seeing on the screen. I'm seeing the words on the screen because I'm watching it subtitled because I, because I don't speak Russian, of course. But these words I'm seeing, these words I'm reading, and these images that I'm seeing accompany them feel totally out of step with each other. What's going on? But, but once you realize that this is a film 
that in a really essential and fundamental way is about generations struggling to communicate with each other and failing about how the memories and experiences and dreams and ideals of a father or a mother might be at a total disconnect from the same feelings and dreams and ideals of a child and that that child when they grow up may end up thinking and feeling and dreaming and hoping for things and having experiences that are at a total disconnect and totally divided from the experiences of their own child and that may continue from generation to generation to generation then you're like oh this choice that Tarkovsky made actually makes a, a lot of sense he's actually showing us that this disconnect exists even in his own life even in his own relationship with his father and that just adds another layer of just purely heartbreaking intimacy to everything that's happening in this movie. And indeed, if the film stopped there, this would be a pretty bleak and pretty sad and pretty depressing film. But it's not. It's not at all. It's actually, in some ways, a really profoundly moving and uplifting and, by its conclusion, oddly optimistic movie. And that's because Tarkovsky does not just give in, does not just surrender to miscommunication, doesn't just throw up his hands and say, well, I guess we can't ever really know another human being, so eh, to hell with it. Here's your bleak existential film. Get out of here. No, not at all. Instead, Tarkovsky is really, in this film, invested in trying to find a way across that vast, void of miscommunication that separates human individuals from each other. In many ways, the film actually plays out almost as a search for universal language, as a real attempt to find the words or images necessary to communicate real truth and real feeling and real authentic experience between individuals and between generations in spite of that tremendous divide that lies between us and the tremendous distance that we all struggle to cross when we're trying to connect to another human being and really express ourselves. And this is evident even in the first scene of the film. So the film opens with a sequence about this adolescent boy who has a severe stutter and who is being treated for that stutter by a hypnotist. And we watch as this boy first struggles to communicate. We see him being asked to try to speak and we watch him stutter and struggle. And we see the anguish that brings him. And then we watch as he's hypnotized, as he's like drawn out of his consciousness and then after he's hypnotized, the hypnotist asks him to speak and he's able to communicate clearly. And so what does that say about the film? What does that say about the intentions of the film? What does that say about what Tarkovsky is trying to accomplish? Well, yes, it gets into that idea of a struggle to communicate, a struggle to really be able to express ourselves and what it means to be a single unique human individual to other people. But, as I said before, it doesn't end there. If this was just a movie about that, about how impossible it is to connect with others, if it was just about how vain it is and how impossibly difficult it is to try to communicate our real authentic thoughts and feelings to other human beings, it would end with the poor kid stuttering with the poor kid struggling to speak. But instead, we watch him be hypnotized and we watch him discover the means to communicate. And I'm going to offer that that's really what the film does to us as an audience. We're presented, first off, with that impossible struggle to communicate that I've talked about at length at this point. But then 
the movie draws us in. The movie hypnotizes us. The movie draws us out of our own ego and our own identity and our own rigid, narrow, anxious, self-obsessed self and into this larger, deeper world that exists outside of ourself. And by the end of the film, I think we've arrived at a place where we feel like something profound has been shared, something profound has been communicated. And I think the universal language that Tarkovsky finds, the tool that he uses to hypnotize us, is beauty. Because this film is just full of gorgeous images. But it goes beyond that because it's not simply a slideshow of picturesque landscapes or of, you know, close-ups of beautiful faces or something. Instead, what I think Tarkovsky is in pursuit of is a kind of universal shared and deeply spiritual sense of beauty. He wants to find transcendental beauty, beauty that transcends the single human being's tastes and experiences. And I think that he arrives at that through a few different techniques, and more than techniques, by reusing a few different motifs and a few different kinds of images and kinds of symbols throughout the film. One of these great universal sources of beauty that Tarkovsky really focuses on and hones in on and repeats again and again throughout the film is a kind of elemental beauty, a beauty that's rooted in the basic elements that surround us, that are part of every human being's life. And in particular, the film is full of scenes of wind, water, and fire. You get wind in the movie very early on. There's this shot where a man is standing in a field full of high grass and the wind just whips across the field and moves every individual blade of grass one by one. Every plant in this field just shimmers and moves. And it's almost as if like a giant breathed on this set. It's almost as if you're seeing the breath of God kind of expelled and just ripple through this field. And that image is repeated multiple times throughout the film. And similarly, this film is full of water and especially running water and especially, especially rain. There are so many sequences in this film that are set during rainstorms or where you're inside a building observing rain through the window on the other side of the building, or characters standing out in the rain, characters running through the rain, rain that materializes out of nowhere. And there are also scenes where it will be raining inside of houses, where water will just be dripping down the walls and off of the ceilings of interiors of buildings. And then fire crops up again and again and again throughout the film. In fact, one of the most iconic images from the film is of a woman watching a barn burn. And we get multiple other fires that are central to other scenes in the movie, whether it's bonfires or fires in fireplaces or whatever. And in addition to that, there are multiple scenes throughout the film that mix water and fire, especially rain and fire. You have a couple of scenes where it's raining, but there's also a fire burning in the foreground or in a place that's central to the viewer's attention, that's central to the shot. So what's going on with all this wind and rain and fire? Well, I think this is part of that pursuit of this kind of universal language of the profound and the beautiful. Because if you think about it, just about every human being who has ever lived has had a moment in their life where they were either in awe of the power of fire or soothed by the sound of rain or simply moved by the sight of wind 
stirring in the trees. These are shared sources of powerful emotion. These are emotional signifiers that transcend any one human being's life. These are things that we can all, I think, kind of universally agree are beautiful, are things that have moved all of us at some point. And more than that, wind and rain and fire have been imbued with real spiritual significance by human beings throughout history and throughout different cultures and civilizations. I mean, what was it that descended upon the apostles at Pentecost, according to the Christian tradition, and gave them the power to speak in tongues, the power to break out of their limited language and really share their experience with people throughout the world. Well, it was tongues of fire. And of course, that's just one small example of the many, many ways that these elemental forces have been framed as something of real spiritual and religious significance. And in fact, Tarkovsky references another instance right within the film itself. He talks about Moses and the burning bush, which of course was another instance where there's this moment of real impossible communication. God speaks to Moses through the burning bush. But within the film, it's presented in a little bit more of an ambiguous and different light. Because what happens is the central character, Alexei, is observing his son setting fire to a bush outside the window. And he asks his ex-wife who it was in scripture who had the experience with the burning bush. And for a moment, neither of them can remember that it was Moses. And it's fascinating because it's another instance of failed communication. And in fact, after they finally remember that it was Moses, one of them expresses that they wish they could have that, that sort of experience. They bemoan the fact that they've never had that kind of clear and profound religious experience where something is just revealed to them in that sort of divine way. So you have this return to the theme of failed communication framed within this universal symbol that communicates its meaning clearly to us, that communicates through its intense beauty and through its simplicity, through the way that it channels an experience of all that we've all had. And Tarkovsky does a similar thing with milk and with food in this film. You get a lot of these beautiful shots of tables that are set with food, of people sitting down to eat. And you have a, many shots in the movie that incorporate milk in one way or another. You see milk spilled on tables. You see a child holding a jug of milk at another moment. You see a woman who has just finished milking a cow carrying the, carrying the tray of milk. You, you see all of these images of milk and food incorporated throughout the film. And these images of food and milk are often presented in this gorgeously framed way that almost makes them look like still life paintings. And so why feature these images of milk and food so prominently in the film? Well, and you can probably almost guess this, but that's another shared universal source of beauty and meaning and feeling. Because we all need to eat. I mean, that, that goes without saying, right? And milk is the first food that we ever have. Milk is the closest thing to a wellspring of human life, to the essential and f most fundamental source of human nourishment imaginable. And so milk and food serve as another shared source of reference, another shared source of beauty, and another way for us to recognize something essential and shared about our humanity 
in this film. Another way in which this film is able to speak in simple terms and in beautiful terms to everyone in its audience, to everyone who is sitting down and watching it. And of course, food is something that's been imbued with deep spiritual significance as well. The Eucharist is central to Catholicism. The Sacrament of Communion is central to a lot of Christian denominations. And indeed, many other religions have rituals surrounding the preparation and consumption of food. Think of Passover. Think of the way that fasts and feasts are central to Islam. Going back to the most ancient and primal religions, animal sacrifice is present. And animal sacrifice is deeply tied to sources of food. And in fact, animal sacrifices were often about ensuring the arrival of the harvest and were often tied deeply to harvest time. And many religious feast days are called feast days for a reason and often are closely intertwined with the harvest and with actual physical meals experienced between human beings and experiences this kind of great shared spiritual and communal moment. And the third source of universal beauty that Tarkovsky weaves throughout the film is nostalgia for childhood. There's a reason why we see the central character, Alexei, so often and so directly as a child and why the film goes to such great lengths to obfuscate him and to hide him when he's an adult. The film really centers upon that unique sense of wonder and joy that children experience. And I, <laughs> and I hate to like crassly advertise my other work here, but I do have a video that dives more deeply into the question of wonder and what it means to experience childhood wonder. So you can, uh, you can check that out if you want to, and I'm not going to go too deep into that here. But suffice to say, any adult alive probably has these deep and intense and powerful and spiritual associations with the time that they were a child. And the film plays heavily and beautifully with those associations. And in fact, dreams about childhood are very central to the film. And the childhood sequences in the film are those in which it's hardest to discern memory from dream, and in which memory sequences blend seamlessly into dream sequences. And in fact, there's a monologue that the main character, Alexei, gives near the climax of the film about dreams that he has about being back at his grandparents' farm and the experience of being a child again through the lens of dream and how powerful and how heartbreaking that is. And I know I, for one, was just absolutely devastated by that monologue because, um, ironically, I spent the first few years of my life living with my grandparents because my parents uh, took my dad a little while to get a job and really get settled on his own. So for the first few years of my childhood, my parents were living with my grandparents. And those are some of the most beautiful and powerful memories that I have still even to this day. That sense of a whole family being joined together under one roof and that sense of being in my grandparents' house and having those sorts of experiences of childhood, of feeling like being fully integrated into a larger family. Those are profound experiences, and those are experiences that the film captures exquisitely. And those are experiences that I think, like the other ones that I've spoken about so far, are fairly universal, even though we don't all have the same childhood, and even though you know, many people never meet their grandparents or, extra or estranged from their grandparents or one or both parents. I think a lot of people 
have this kind of sense of there being some time before the fall, of being a time before the loss of innocence, whatever that may be for them. And that experience of living in innocence and through innocence and having these kind of pure, uncontaminated experiences are something that I think most human beings can understand and something that the film goes out of its way to present in a way that we can all understand and relate to. And finally, and I think this is maybe a little bit more speculative and a little bit more wild and out there, but I think the film is trying to present the possibility of there being a kind of universal shared memory and a kind of universal shared experience that transcends any given individual. And in fact, that transcends even humanity itself. So one of the first scenes in the movie features a conversation between two characters where one character presents to the other the possibility that plants might be sentient, that plants might actually have some understanding of what's going on, and that plants might in fact have a kind of wisdom that humans don't. There's this kind of intimation of the possibility of a, of a sort of shared earthly consciousness of these plants with these roots that are intertwined, that are sending cognitive signals to each other. And that, I think, can be sort of abstracted out to an idea of this kind of larger shared consciousness that transcends us. And personally, I don't think plants are sentient. Personally, I don't think grass and trees are thinking. But I think it's kind of a great metaphor, a kind of a great way to visualize and conceptualize this idea that maybe some part of our consciousness exists outside of ourselves and transcends ourselves. And in fact, that very same scene concludes with the first instance of that image I talked about before of the wind sweeping through the grass. So when we see the wind ripple through the grass and we watch that whole field move in unison, almost in a synchronized, almost in an intelligent and intentional way, that only underscores what the character had said earlier. That only adds an extra layer of significance to that conversation about the possibility of plant life being sentient on some level. And only serves to indicate and hint towards the possibility of some greater shared universal intelligence. And all of this comes together beautifully and wonderfully in the final scene of the movie. The final sequence of the film involves a couple of elements. One is this incredible long shot that's set really close to the ground with the camera aiming down and the camera kind of pans over this stretch of earth. And what you see is not only grass and dirt and rocks and all of these natural things that you expect to see on the ground, but also these bits of human trash, these leftover pieces of detritus from human life and human civilization. And in fact, you it pans over the foundation of a destroyed building that may very well be that barn that burned down earlier in the film. And you see within the foundation of that building, you know, dishes and pans and containers and all these things that humans leave behind, all these little bits and pieces of everyday human life intermingled with grass, intermingled with plant life that's just growing up and that's just come to consume what was left of this human structure. And you get this really vivid image of human life and the life of the earth being completely and entirely intertwined, being basically one, being inseparable. 
And then, as part of the very same final sequence, we go through this stretch where we first see the central character's mother. We see Alexei's mother as a young woman with his father as a young man. And she's talking about being pregnant and whether he would want their first child to be a boy or a girl. And then within, once again, this same sequence, we see Alexei as a child with his sister and with his mother. But the mother we see him with is his mother as an old woman, the mother from the present day sequences as opposed to the past sequences. And so we have in this one uninterrupted sequence sort of the complete collapse of any distinction between the past and the present, between things dreamed and re remembered, between the earth itself and the people that inhabit it. You have everything from the film being consumed and subsumed into this kind of one shared moment that demolishes all the divisions and the distinctions between them. And you have this one sort of beautiful shared moment of unity and of maybe finally true communication. And yeah, that's it. I'm going to end there. I have more I could say about the film. I could probably make two or three more videos just about the larger themes of the film, just about what makes it beautiful. But I've burned through two batteries and I'm on my second SD card and this is going to be one hell of a pain to edit. So I think I'm going to end it there. That said, stay tuned for a second video about Mirror where I really dig into a single scene from the film and really explore what makes that scene tick, what makes it work, what makes it wonderful. So yeah, stay tuned for that. And of course, thank you so much. If you're watching this, thank you for sticking through to the end. Um, if you don't mind, if you could like and subscribe, those things really help me with the algorithm. And even better, if you want to leave a comment, that would be wonderful. I've gotten so many just really insightful comments on my past videos, and I try my best to read all of them. I respond to as many as I can. And it always gives me a new perspective on what I'm talking about. I mean, to hell with the algorithm. It's just fascinating to hear what other people have to say about these topics that I'm so like into and so obsessed with. So yeah, that's it for real now. Thank you so much. I guess goodbye, good night, hell, whatever. Okay. <laughs> Boy, I'm running out of battery and I am running out of it and I'm on my second SD card. God help me.